Remember that the tarot is a great and sacred arcanum. Its abuse is an obscenity in the inner and a folly in the outer. It is intended for quite other purposes than to determine when the tall dark man will meet the fair rich widow. Jack Parsons Few of us might have actually had a tarot card reading, but this practice is so ingrained in the zeitgeist of the Western world that most of us at least know the gist of it. A simple reading of a specialized deck of cards might give us insight into our past, present, or future. But what are the details of the strange practice? Where did it come from? Does it work? Or is it all just baloney? Let's see if the cards are in our favor on this sweet episode of Snipe Hunt. I play the Knight of Swords in attack mode, and with that, I will end my turn. Beat that, Jeremy. You fool! You just activated the effect of my Empress card! The Empress? No way! I thought that legendary card was just a myth! Face it, Darren! I win! Empress! Obliterate! No! <laughs> well... <laughs> Now that now that y'all have uh, annoyed the uh, the tarot enthusiasts, <laughs> this is Snipe Hunt, your frightening folklore podcast. I am your host, Gary the Hermit, and I am your host, Darren the Hierophant, and I am Jeremy the other Hermit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and just in case you somehow tuned out this entire episode so far, and if you have, I don't blame you. Uh, we are discussing tarot cards. Uh, tonight's show is going to have a similar format to the last episode, since we're talking about another divination game. But unlike the Ouija board, we'll actually demonstrate the product in this one, uh, mostly because the probability of summoning demons is much lower. Jeremy, welcome back to the show. Uh, last time we saw Jeremy was all the way back in episode 10, which was our uh, apparently lesser known vampires episode, which we discussed some of the many origins for the modern vampire legends. So definitely go listen to that if you haven't already, because we need some listens on it. So we all tried to record in the same room at the same time, but Gary couldn't make it. So it's just me and Jeremy and Jeremy is actually recording in a different room because our mics were picking up each other. And I couldn't fix that through the remote software we're using because Gary is recording remotely uh, as we, we have been with our yeah, episodes. You know, it's funny is like yesterday whenever I woke up and I told you, I was like, something just isn't, you know, it, today's just not going to work out. Well, right. It was, it was about four, you know, four, four thirty whenever you wanted us to be at Jeremy's. And um, I got that call from work and they had thrown 10 Walmarts on me to go deliver oh, grill bottles. So, yeah, I clocked out at two o'clock a.m. Oh, that's fun. So, right. So. So. We did need, at least two of us needed to be in the same room for the demonstration at the end of the episode where I will read Jeremy. Um, so before we get into this, what are your guys' first impressions about tarot? What do you think of it based on what you know right now? You know, I was raised with it um, because my stepmom and uh, I mean, she never like, I never asked to have her do anything with it. And I never, yeah. you know, I never I mean, I was intrigued. I think deep in my mind, I was intrigued by it. But I just, I'm one of them people that if you don't, you know, don't mess with the unknown. You know what I mean? Right, right. So, so it's just, you know, it's one of them things. That's how I've always lived, whether it be any kind of religion or uh, I'm going to mute myself. I was about to say, it's very loud over there. <laughs> Jeremy, what are your thoughts on tarot? I mean, I think it's a pretty interesting concept using cards to tell fortunes or anything of that nature. But my biggest thing is, is why isn't it got like a broad spectrum as where the Ouija board, you hear it from all sorts of media while the tarot cards, why don't we hear about that as often? Yeah. We all, we all like know about tarot cards, but we don't really hear anything about them. Um, uh, you actually suggested this episode, Jeremy. So was there any particular reason for that? I mean, like I said, I hear more about Ouija boards, so I think that the tarot cards deserve a little bit of a spotlight in that regards. And I was more intrigued because of a certain anime you and I both watch at some point. 
I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so when I think of tarot, I, I just I just jump to like fortune telling. I'm like the right. your stereotypical like old lady in like a bandana. She's got like a crystal ball and she's got her tarot cards. So that's what I think. But uh, yeah. so let's uh, with those first impressions in mind, let's go ahead and jump into it. So what exactly is tarot? But if you guys hear anything in the background, it's coming from Gary's mic, and we apologize for it, but this is the best way we can do it right now. So here we go. Yeah. Okay. So what exactly is tarot? Well, according to the totally credible website, sagegoddess.com, quote, the tarot is a symbolic map of consciousness that encompasses our journey through life, both spiritually and practically. Tarot reading is the practice of divining wisdom and guidance through a specific spread or layout of tarot cards. However, contrary to popular belief, the cards do not simply tell your fortune, and one does not have to be psychic in order to give tarot readings. The cards are meant to provide insight into the innermost truths of your higher self. In other words, the cards provide an evolved awareness of what you already know deep within. (laughs) <laughs> End quote. So in blunt, non-New Agey terms, uh, tarot is a form of cartomancy, which is a type of divination using cards. In tarot, one would gain insight into the past, present, or future by drawing and interpreting the cards. All right, so with that, we'll go ahead and get into the history of tarot. So playing cards themselves were thought to be invented in China in the 9th century, as the first mention of a game that involved cards that was described in a text uh, from that time by Tang Dynasty writer Su Yi, which is probably the uh, most easy pronounced Chinese name of all time. Su Yi described a, quote, leaf game played by the royal family, but details on that are hazy. So they think the leafs are the cards in this case, I guess. British sinologist William Henry Wilkinson a sinologist is just someone who studies China and Chinese culture, suggests that the first cards may have been paper currency, which also doubled as playing tools, as well as the stakes being played for. Playing with actual money was inconvenient and dangerous, so these money cards were made to play with. Similar to uh, playing poker with the chips, as well as, you know, betting the chips. So imagine playing poker, but instead of using cards, you're actually using the chips themselves. So it's almost like a trading card at that point, because it's like, oh, you won this card. Yada yada. Yeah, except there's no uh, exchange. It's just right, more right. like you get to keep yes. it. Yeah, kind of like trading card, not so much. But so the earliest recorded playing card game was a trick taking game, and that just means highest card wins, called Madao. I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it, but whatever. Um, so this game consisted of four suites, uh, similar to modern day playing cards, but these represented different amounts of currency. The suites were coins strings of coins, myriads of coins, and tens of myriads, which is not really uh, fun to say, nor very catchy, but playing cards then spread throughout Asia and came in a variety of forms. And in Persia and Arabia, the four suites uh, then started to have face cards to represent them in the forms of kings and viziers. And the suites started to show uniformity across all sets by commonly having the suite of coins, clubs, jugs, and swords, which is better than... uh, Strings of coins and tens of myriads, I guess. (laughs) They then spread to the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt, where they were developed further. Um, The oldest surviving set of playing cards we have today are fragments that date from this period in the 12th and 13th centuries. It was from Egypt that most scholars think playing cards finally spread to Europe. The first accepted record of playing cards in Europe was a ban of them in Florence, Italy. So they found like little records of saying, hey, you can't use these cards anymore. And they were most likely banned as because they were used as tools of gambling, which was immoral. So can't gamble. Finally, we get to actual tarot, the first packs of which uh, appeared in Italy between 1440 and 1450, where they were called Carte de Triomphi. <laughs> there went all your Italian listeners. Yeah, there, there they go. I'm just going to sound like Mario. It's fine. Or triumph cards. And then just triumphy, which is where we get the word Trump and the term Trump cards. And, you know, to this day, some face cards, especially using tarot decks, are called Trump cards. Um, these decks were also called tarochi, which were later evolved into the term tarot as we know it. 
These tarot decks were used to play card games of all sorts. Um, so at this point, like the tarot deck was just used for games. It wasn't used for anything else. It was just regular. It was just kind of deck of playing cards. So the card around this time may have been used for playful divination, similar to the childhood game MASH, which is, uh, I can't remember what MASH stands for, but do you know that game, Gary? Yeah, I'm looking it up right now. Uh, I, you said MASH. I automatically thought of the, the old TV sit- Oh, okay. Sitcom. Well, it's it's a it's a paper and pencil game. Uh, I think I played it a couple times. Oh, during the yeah, brief I remember time that as, yeah. from back in school. Yeah. Mansion, yeah. A, mansion, mansion apartment, shack house, but. So it was oh, like, that's right. So it's not like legit divination. It was just more like a playful, like, ho ho, let's see what happens. So around this time, tarot was sort of used for that, but it wasn't really anything serious. But they weren't used for that for serious cart- cartomancy until around 1750. Tarot readings became popular in 1780 when the Tarot or of Marseille deck, which seems to be the deck that all modern tarot sets are based on, came out. So the first to assign divinatory meetings to these cards was card romancer Jean-Baptiste Alietta, otherwise known as Alietta, or Atelia, Atelia, which is literally just his name backwards. Um, so that was like his pen name or pseudonym or whatever you want to call it. Atelia created the first deck to be used exclusively for card romancy. He believed that the cards had power and originated from ancient Egypt, which is untrue, but, you know, playing cards kind of spread to Europe from Egypt, so... He sort of had something to base that on. Um, but it was during the beginnings of Egyptomania, which is categorized as an obsession with ancient Egypt remains and artifacts around this time. So if anything was thought to be n- mystical in nature, then it must originate from ancient Egypt. So Europe was kind of obsessed with Egypt this time. So tarot continued to be popularized by famous cardomancers, such as Marie and Lenormand. It's, that's not how you pronounce it, but whatever. Who was the first to practice cardomancy for people in high places? So it started to gain popularity among royalty and such. And uh, Lifus Levi, that wasn't his real name, um, who wrote extensively about tarot and claimed it originated from a group of ancient Egyptian texts collectively known as the Book of Thoth, texts that were allegedly written by the Egyptian god of knowledge himself. Uh, the Book of Thoth also appears in, in an Egy- ancient Egyptian story and contained a spell that would allow one to perceive the gods. So the Book of Thoth is like this very mystical thing. Um, Levi also documented how the cards were the key to forgotten knowledge in ancient magic. He virtually had no evidence uh, to support these claims, as all the evidence points to tarot originating just as normal playing cards and didn't for a game. In fact, the playing cards that we all use today originate from tarot cards, so... Everything came from tarot, pretty much. Although the connections to the occult that Levi wrote down is still believed to a degree in modern New Age form of tarot, which now puts it in a similar category as healing crystals and modern astrology. Now we move on to the modern tarot deck. The deck is made up of 78 cards divided into two categories, the major arcana and the minor arcana. The major arcana are the most famous of the cards and represent the forces of our lives as well as life lessons. The cards of the major arcana are numbered 0 to 21 and include the fool, the magician, the high priestess, the empress, the emperor, the hierophant, hierophant, (laughs) the lovers, the chariot, strength, the hermit, me and Jeremy, Wheel of Fortune. Wheel of Fortune. (laughs) Justice. The Hanged Man. Death. Temperance. The Devil. The Tower. The Star. The Moon. The Sun. Judgment. The World. And the signed 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle card, which is the most valuable card in the set. That is... (laughs) (laughs) I'm, I'm glad you kept a straight face. At least kept a straight voice through that. <laughs> uh, the minor arcana are the forerunners to the standard deck of playing cards today and are divided into four suites. Pentacles, uh, which are, I guess, coins. Yeah, coins that have a little like pentacle symbol on them or as it's sometimes known in more pentagram, but I guess it depends on which way it's facing, but whatever. Cups, rods, and swords. 
Each of these suites have face cards or court cards, which are kings, queens, knights, and pages. And, of course, the rest are numbered cards. Yeah, so just like four of wands or three of cups or yada yada. The suites have assigned elements and represent different aspects of life. Pentacles are connected to the element of earth and are connected to physical aspects such as property, work, and finances. Cups are connected with water and represent emotions and relationships. Rods are connected with fire and represent energy, action, and growth. Swords are connected to air and represent intellect, reason, and clarity. Well, I hope you all are writing this down, because there will be a quiz at the end of the episode. Oh, boy. Yeah. The court cards often represent the people in our lives. Kings are often mature men of authority. Queens are mature women of authority. Knights are often dynamic, unmarried young men, and pages represent young novices of some sort. And each of the suites are also associated with zodiac signs of the same element. For example, pentacles are associated with the earth signs Taurus and Virgo. Major arcana are also associated with zodiac signs, an example being the Hierophant is associated with Taurus and the Hermit is associated with Virgo. But the meaning of the cards, they each have their own meaning, but they're not really fixed and um, they are often different depending on the person, especially the cards of the Major Arcana. The meanings of the cards can vary greatly and are often derived from the imagery of the card, the title of the card, the meanings provided in the set booklet, and personal experiences or insights from others. Um, Also, they can vary on the reading depending because you have to not only connect it to the situation or the question that the questioner asks, but you have to connect it to the other cards during that reading too. So each card has their own set meaning, but each one can be different as well, depending on who's reading them. And the situation, correct? Yes. If all this sounds kind of confusing and tedious, you're right. It eventually breaks down to where every single card has its own meaning And yet the interpretation of these meanings can vary wildly depending on the person interpreting them. We definitely won't go into every meaning as even just the major arcana would take forever. So how does one do a reading? Well, there are only a million ways to do one. So we'll just cover the basics right now. Okay. So they kind of said this earlier when we were reading that definition from sagegodscout.com, but do you have to be a psychic to read tarot cards? Well, kind of, but not really, no. So pretty much everything I found said you don't technically have to be a psychic, but you do have to practice tarot reading and train to develop intuition. So no offense to anyone who believes in this. Uh, I'm definitely not one of those people, but all aboard the crazy train next south of Cuckoo Town. <laughs> Strap in. Oh, uh, geez. In order to read tarot cards, you must develop your intuition and a relationship with the cards. Psychic ability is a refined form of intuition, and you may gain psychic ability as a result of your training your intuition. To develop this, you can meditate to practice quieting your mind. Investigate all kinds of psychic abilities to see if your intuition reacts to one of these. Clairvoyance, or the ability to supernaturally see into the future, is an example of this, and often the ability people associate with tarot. Listen to your instincts when it comes to any situation. Now you must spend time with the cards. First, start by drawing a card a day, then see how your day plays out according to the card you drew. Keep a tarot journal. After you draw your daily card, record your impressions of the card without consulting a tarot guide. Also in your tarot journal, record your practice readings and any other impressions about tarot. Start with one card spread. This will help you apply the cards to different situations. Then move on to a three-card spread. This will further train you. Apply different meanings to each of the cards in the spread, such as past, present, and future. And finally, practice reading without looking at the book. Make sure to get really good at making a (laughs) bullshit. I mean, developing your intuition. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so now on to our actual tarot set. Um, I bought the Essential Tarot Book and Card Set. From Peter Popper Press, try saying that three times fast, on Amazon specifically for this episode. And according to the book, here is how you do it. Try to conduct your readings in a tranquil space. (laughs) Noise and distraction. How ironic. (laughs) This place, this is not it. (laughs) (laughs) Noise and distraction interrupt the energy flow and can result in a fragmenting reading or Or podcast reading. Bring some very negative goddamn energy (laughs) to the room. The reader and the questioner, the person whose cards are to be read, should clear their minds of extraneous thoughts and concentrate on the cards. 
Use a table and two chairs for the reading. Before beginning, it is essential that you recognize the effect that you may have upon the questioner. The most ancient rule applies here. First, do not harm. Use caution at all times. Whenever possible, steer the questioner in a positive direction. Keep things upbeat. Although you handle the cards carefully and maintain a focused attitude, a tarot reading should be fun for both the reader and the questioner. Your job is to help the questioner take constructive action to realize important goals and make positive life changes. So it's pretty much all about positivity here. Um, so the questioner most must focus on a particular question they want answered. They focus on this while shuffling the deck. While shuffling the cards, the questioner states the question out loud to the reader, then hands the reader the deck. My little booklet says, quote, by handling the cards, the questioner imbues them with personal magnetism, creating a rapport between the subconscious and the cards, end quote. So basically, the questioner just marinates the deck in their own psychic juices. Mmm, yummy. So now the reader has the juiced up shovel deck and starts to draw cards and lay them in a certain formation or spread face down. There are a ton of different spreads the reader can do. Uh, We'll cover some in a bit. My booklet says to always read the cards from the reader's position instead of the questioner's position. This matters because the cards can mean something else if they're inverted or turned upside down. But other sources say you can read them from the reader's position. So it's all just confusing and kind of contradictory. But, you know, what what did you expect? Yeah. What did you expect from this? Um, So you're supposed to turn the cards over horizontally from left to right. So the cards are facing the same way as they were when they were face down. So upright cards have a stronger positive meaning, while inverted cards have a weaker negative or opposite meaning. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, though. It just depends on the situation and the cards and the position and everything else. The majority of the cards should always be in an upright position. So if the first card the reader flips is upside down, uh, then you can flip the other cards over vertically. So you're reading from the questioner's position so that the majority of the cards are upright. So you get to cheat a little bit to make sure that it's a positive reading. So always try to make it positive, even if you have to cheat, apparently. Um, It then goes on to say that each reading is different and to look for subtle clues the questioner gives to steer the reading in the right direction. So look at the questioner and be like, all right, how can I make myself seem psychic? And just give off any clues and then try to steer the reader towards that. It then ends with, quote, sometimes you can reveal unconscious issues and help open the door to spiritual growth in unexpected ways. Let your intuition be your guide, end quote. A a couple more things before we get into or onto actual readings. First, let's talk about tarot spreads. The way you draw and lay out the cards in a certain pattern in order to do a reading. Okay. There are a million different spreads you can do, but one of the most popular spreads today is the, the Celtic cross spread. This spread involves 10 cards. Two cards cross each other in the center, followed by one card on each side, as well as one above and one below the center to make six cards. Then the last four are placed in a vertical line on the right side of the cross. You flip over the first six cards first, and they mean the following. First card represents you or your current position. The card that crosses you is an obstacle or an immediate influence. The card above you is your goal. The card to the right of you is your distant past. The card on the bottom is your recent past, and the card to your left is is your immediate future. After going through those, you then flip over the remaining four. From bottom to top here is what they represent. The questioner's feelings, outside influences, hidden emotions, and finally, the outcome. So it's probably easier if you have like a diagram of the Celtic cross spread pulled up. Just look it up and you'll, you'll see what we're talking about. I'll definitely include one in the gallery for this episode on our social media pages. So this spread is probably the most popular because it offers a ton of information and the spread is just kind of cool looking, but it does take way too long for this podcast. Plus, I'm not very practiced in making up, I mean, reading the cards. So we're going to opt for the simpler seven card horseshoe spread. But the question is, does tarot work? Let's talk about how tarot supposedly works. First, the magical psychic metaphysical explanation. This explanation was surprisingly hard to find. Does a supernatural force guide the cards or does our inner spiritual self choose the cards for us? Well, because there are no set ways to read or interpret the cards, the metaphysical explanation also varies widely. 
It included the first two I mentioned, that a vague cosmic force determines the cards chosen in order to give one a glimpse into themselves and their future. And the explanation that tarot helps us tap into the subconsciousness of our inner spiritual selves and other similar New Age explanations. Yeah, so nobody can really agree on that. Um, But the strangest one I found was from this WordPress site by a self-described author under the pen name Jack of Wands. Um, first of all, he seemed pretty narcissistic and compared the practice of tarot with Einstein's theory of general relativity in order to give it a scientific edge. Won't get too much into it, but Einstein's theory basically states that space and time are interwoven into a single continuum known as space time and events that occur at the same time for one observer could ab- occur at different times for another, depending on their location in space or space time. Uh, and so basically Jack Wands was cherry picking from this theory for tarot and stated that uh, time is not linear. Therefore, the use of tarot to predict the future could be applied as it, quote, gives us access to other points in space time, end quote, which makes him sound so smart. Uh, He made sure at the end of the article to tell the reader that he's a grad student, but didn't tell us what he studies. He also failed to mention on how tarot gives us access to space time, just that it does. And how gravity plays into it, and I bring up gravity, because gravity as a force kind of what the whole basis for Einstein's theories of special and general relativity are based on. Gravity didn't really work into his tarot theory, so he conveniently left that part out. So basically, he's like, we can time travel briefly, (laughs) use astral project, space time, yada, yada. And I was like, okay, buddy. He sounds crazy to me. Yeah, I I just wanted to (laughs) include that in there. It was fine. Hmm. As far as a psychological explanation, surprisingly enough, there is a foundation for tarot giving us insight into a situation. Dr. Inna Sametsky from Columbia University put it this way. Tarot cards are universally applicable and, uh, and can create a visualization of your situation. Once you see things laid out, it becomes clear what you actually want. They help you externalize your problems. Carl Jung, the father of analytical psychiatry, was very interested in the psychological insight of, that tarot might give us. They are psychological images, symbols with which one plays, as the unconscious seems to play with its contents. The cards combine in certain ways, and the different combinations correspond to the playful development of mankind. This, too, is how tarot works, with the added dimensions of symbols or pictures of symbolical situations. The images, the hanged man, the tower, the sun, are sort of archetypal ideas of a differentiated nature. So basically, the imagery and symbolism of the cards and our own personal interpretation of them could actually give us insight into ourselves or how we feel about a situation. So in fact... Tarot could very well be beneficial even as a form of therapy. But do they actually work to predict the future? Some swear by the tarot card's ability to do this. Well, the short answer is no. People who actually believe in this will often form a cognitive bias or justification in order for the cards to work. For example, you would remember the instances where the tarot reading was correct, but not when the tarot reading was wrong. You can do a reading 10 times, and only if one reading was correct in predicting the future, it would seem like tarot is real. So it's what I'm getting from it is like a horse. Yeah, I was about to say that too. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it's very similar in that, and everyone uh, tries to develop a bias based on it. Like if if your tarot cards say you're going to meet – like a, a an attractive lady today and then they did and then it does you're like oh it worked but if you also had 10 other readings saying that same thing and you didn't do it you wouldn't really remember those parts uh, as much as you would where it worked so there's also confirmation bias where if one believes that tarot works then tarot is going to work for them because they believe it will and there's also illusory correlations bias illusory correlations bias uh where humans see patterns and correlations everywhere even if there aren't any, that's just kind of built into our DNA. One common one is is the ability to make uh, see faces and patterns. We pretty much evolved to look for faces. So they see this and make a connection anyway. For example, if you get a tarot reading that includes a page face card, remember that the page indicates someone young or novice at something. And then you go to Starbucks and meet an employee who's on their first day. You might make the connection between the new employee and the novice card reading you had, despite not being any real connection. Of course, confirmation bias plays into this as well. 
It, it, the other thing that I get though is like people are really could be obsessed with this. Like, say if they get a fortune, like something bad's going to happen, so they're just going to act very depressed and yeah, they're going to expect gloomy. something bad to happen, and almost it almost a self fulfilling prophecy at that point. Yeah, well, it, it, you know, it's almost like you know, some people just they have to find something to you, you know, if their if if their life is not being fulfilled in some sort of way, they they try to search for something, just something to give them a scapegoat to blame. A, a sca- yeah, or, or you know, just. just they need a reason. They want. They want something to look forward to. They want. A, they want a reason why. Right. I mean, you know, they, they want an excuse. Pretty much. Work. Not even. Not even necessarily an excuse. Just something that even just makes them feel better. I mean, you could do it. Something to grab onto. Yeah, it could just, be tarot. It could be like religion. It could be just just yeah. about anything. Really, um, they want to believe that there's some other force in the universe and they're not alone. Almost. Exactly. But, so yeah, there's a lot of we can go into that, but. It's finally time for the tarot reading. I hope you're ready. Uh, So I'm just going to do Jeremy, and we're going to be doing the seven-card horseshoe reading. So, Jeremy, if you want to come into this room, we'll get the mic set up, and we'll give it a go. Okay, so me and Jeremy are sharing a mic, and we're sitting across from each other right now. Um, So go ahead and shuffle the cards. However you would like to shuffle them, and I will go ahead and grab my little booklet for the reading. And then uh, while you're shuffling the cards, why don't you go ahead and tell me what your uh, question is? All right. So you know how I'm high strong and always stress out about something, right? No, not you, Jeremy. All right. Well, that's my biggest question. What do I have to do to achieve peace within myself? Okay. That's a good one. It's It's a deep one, but... Uh, I, I'm a novice reader, but I think we can handle that. <laughs> One can hope. Don't let me down, Darren. Yep. Just, just so, just keep shuffling. Wait until you're ready to get, get those psychic juices deep into those cards and get nice and marinated in there. <laughs> Make them just start dripping. <laughs> this is either going into a cooking class or very <laughs> sexual. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up something to help me read these because give me different cards meaning and then i'll pull interpretation from those all right he is handing off the cards and we're going to do our seven card spread so let's do one two three four five six let's move those around a little bit seven all right so we're gonna flip these over one at a time i'm not sure that's how you do it but so the first card is the past and this is probably how like something a past influence is affecting your current situation. We have the five of rods. So let's go ahead and look up what the five of rods meaning is. Does it being that direction mean anything? And it is upright. We're we're uh, I'm reading from my position. Um, so it is upright. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Let's just pull from the imagery first. So it looks like we have some people fighting with a bunch of rods right here. So that might mean some previous conflicts in your past might be affecting your ability to achieve inner peace today. How recent does this have to be? Like, is it, it just says the past. So it could be recent. It could be far back. It's just at some point in your past. Oddly enough, I can already relate to that. So according to five of wands keyword, the keywords in this are conflict, disagreement, competition, tension, diversity. So some sort of past conflict may be affecting your current situation of this. Uh, so let's go ahead and move, flip over the second one, which is the present. So we have the Nine of Cups. Let's go ahead and pull up the Nine of Cups. Let's pull from the imagery first. It's uh, it's a very nice looking old man, at least on my set. Uh, he's got a bunch of cups behind him, uh, equal nine. They're kind of on a shelf. He almost looks like a merchant of some sort. I don't know what to pull from that. And it is also upright as well, which uh, the keywords in this are contentment, satisfaction, gratitude, wish come true. Remind you, this is your present. So maybe uh, your current situation, you're a little too content. It's a little too comfortable. So it's almost preventing you from moving onward. So this might represent your present feelings about the situation. Like a conflict in your past is making you tense in the present. Mm -hmm. But you almost feel like this is how it should be. I feel different. I'm like too comfortable, if that makes any sense. Like if it's changes, then so that might be that. So let's go ahead and move on to the third card, which is what is helping. We have the Eight of Rods. So we got a couple of different rods here and no major arcana yet. But looking at just the imagery, 
that's all it shows. It's just a bunch of rods and it's all kind of shooting downwards. So I'm not sure what the downwards would represent, but let's, let's look up the eight of rods real quick. So this is what is helping and it, uh, and this one's also up, right? It represents movement, fast page change, action alignment. So in order to help your current situation, change would definitely help rapid change specifically, or some sort of action, take some sort of action in order to change your current situation. Uh, so that's, that's pretty straightforward actually. So next we have number four, which is the obstacles to overcome. Ooh, and we have the ace of cups for this one. Um, this one, so far, they're all upright so far. So overall, this is a very positive reading. Um, so the Ace of Cups, the imagery shows a cup in the middle of a lake and it's almost like overflowing. So it's almost like abundant. So at least that's why I'm getting from the uh, imagery of the card. Let's see what the keywords for this are. And we'll do a wrap up at the, uh, at the end of this so we can get the full thing, but we're just going at this. So <laughs> it represents uh, love, new relationships, compassion, or creativity. So maybe... Man, this one's difficult because this is this is super positive and this is supposed to be the the obstacles to overcome. Maybe um, I'm just too comfortable and I can't accept it. Yeah, maybe it's similar to your present. Maybe it's just too comfortable. Um, I don't know. This one's difficult. I'm, I'm not an expert reader. Right. Let's see. Let me just keep reading. So it represents the vessel of your subconscious mind. So maybe you think like it's similar to what you said, like you're too comfortable in this situation. Maybe you're like, or maybe you're being distracted mm -hmm. uh, by different passions of yours to mm -hmm. work instead of working on yourself. You're working on maybe projects, mm -hmm. working on this. At least that's why I'm getting from it since it's a very positive reading. Obstacles overcome is just maybe you're being distracted by other things. Yeah. Um, card number five is the attitudes of others. So maybe the attitudes of others that are affecting this problem you have. We have the king of cups. So we got two face cards in a row, all cups. Um, and this one's also upright and it shows a king sitting on a throne. He has a big old cup right there and he's also holding a scepter. He looks pretty happy and he's sitting, he looks very comfortable as well. Um, uh, so upright represents emotionally balanced, compassionate or diplomatic. So this is the attitudes of others. So it sounds like maybe you have a support system of some sort mm -hmm. to achieve, to make this change in your life to where you go towards more peaceful, non-tense mm -hmm. things. Me. For example, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so maybe it, so it looks like you have a support system mm -hmm. of some sort in place, which is good. Like I said, every card has been upright so far. And we only have two cards left. So now we have what the questioner, you, what you should do about it. Um, and we have the four of pentacles. It shows like this little old man kind of crouching and he's holding, he's stepping on two of the coins and then he's holding it one giant coin and he's got a coin on his head. He kind of reminds you of Rumpelstiltskin in a way. <laughs> Um, so let's just see what uh, what we got here. And let's see. And this one's also upright. It's based around saving money, um, security, conservatism, scarcity control. Um, and this is what you should do. Yeah, this one, see, this is where it gets difficult. It's like yeah. where it doesn't really apply to the situation. And it is upright. Well, one of the keywords is control. So maybe you should control the situation a bit more mm -hmm. instead of being too comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, going back to the eight of rods, maybe just take some action mm -hmm. on it. And that's what you need to do. In the, but in a balanced way, don't like overdo it. Don't underdo it, but just keep it like there yeah. and make sure you're secure with it. Make, don't do anything that would get you necessarily out of your comfort zone, but definitely take action. Um, and here's the outcome. So here's the big answer to your question about whether or not you will achieve this. Um, we have the 10 of pentacles and they all represent different things. So it's kind of hard to string them together, but we'll, we'll see what we got. So this one's also upright and it shows like a family all together and they're surrounded by all the coins. It even has a dog. It has like a grandpa. So all of this seems very positive. So it's looking pretty good. Let's see what the meanings are according to this. So it represents wealth, financial security, family, long-term success, and contribution. So basically, it's just saying, yeah, you're gonna, you're going to achieve your goal based on just this whole reading. Mm -hmm. It's very positive, and Ten of Pentacles representing basically long-term success. Mm -hmm. Then I would say yes. So to put it all together, the past is the Five of Rods. Uh, we got past conflicts affecting your ability to find mm -hmm. inner peace or not be stressed out all the time. We have the present, which is the Nine of Cups, which uh, we presented as being too comfortable as your current self. 
Um, maybe you think changing yourself is a scary situation. The Eight of Rods is what is helping. Um, the Eight of Rods represented change, uh, specifically rapid change. We have the number four, which represents obstacles overcome. We have the Ace of Cups, and we kind of tied it back to to the Nine of Cups, where you're almost too comfortable with the situation, or you feel like this is how it needs to be when it doesn't need to necessarily. On number five, we have the King of Cups, which is attitudes of others. Uh, we got the King of Cups, which is balance and support and all that stuff. And so basically, you do have a support system in place for, to be able to do this. Um, then we have what the questioner should do is the four pinnacles. So go take action, but in a secure and balanced way. Mm -hmm. And then we finished with the 10 of pentacles, which represented success and especially long-term success. So it might take you a bit to reach this goal, but ultimately you are going to achieve it. Well, that's good to hear. So how do you guys think I did for my first uh, tarot reading? I think you need to get used to the cards and what they mean, but I mean, like you said, you're yeah, novice. Yeah, yeah. Sounded and one thing good. I read before I came here was like, minor arcana yeah like they're more like you're able to fix it rather than the major arc arcana they're more fixed I yeah guess, in a way. yeah that makes that makes sense because the major arcana are the quote powerful cards in this and you haven't really you didn't really get one for this reading which isn't necessarily a bad thing if anything it's a good thing it leaves it means i have a little bit of control to this yeah it means you have a lot more control over the situation and yeah I think I, I think I did pretty good for a first one. Uh, right. If any of you people listening actually know anything about tarot, just let me know how I did or how I could do better. But you know what's scary though is is that like all the way up to the King of Cups, I have some sort of relation to at this point in time. I guess that's a good way to uh, look into it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, if you just want to go back into there, we'll finish up. Yeah. Sure. They say that like there's so many different like with the Ouija and all that stuff. Like some people, you know, they they don't see the Ouija as a. Um, some people don't see it as a a negative thing. You know what right, I mean? Right. Um, and tarot isn't. And the tarot is a you know same same thing. Well, like just like with anything, there's so many different beliefs. From what I understand, from what I've been told, is you should never buy your first cards. You know what I mean? Your first cards. Sure, yeah, I did read that somewhere. I was like, well, it's a little too late for that. But. Right. <laughs> right. Right, but and yeah, so, it pretty much ultimately comes down to belief. Like it doesn't really have its roots in you know occult practices or anything mystical. They were just regular playing cards, and eventually they were started to being used for that. It's it's just one of them things. Like uh, it's to, to each their own. You know, uh, however you choose to. Yeah, absolutely. Know. And we did we did say that they definitely could be beneficial, and they do work to a certain degree psychologically. Right. It's just not whether or not they work mystically. Uh, is a whole other thing. Well, I'm one that I believe that everything, everything is mental. Yeah, yeah. everything. Like, yeah. like I'll flat out say it. I was big into horoscope for a while back when I was in college, and when I, every time I thought something good was going to happen because of it, I thought I was in a more positive mood rather than like if I got a bad horoscope. It was more depressing. Like I was more concerned and alert. I guess you could say. Oh, see, I would like I would like to dig deeper into uh, astrological stuff because I have found like like according to my birthday, you know, I'm a Virgo. Right, right. So am I. But if you dig deep into it, though, I'm not just a Virgo. You know, there's there's right, more to right. it. And like, actually, uh, astrology is on the uh, topic list. We probably won't do it for a while since we just did this and we'll we'll branch out to other subjects before we get there. But that is something we're going to do eventually. That'll be that'll be and wicked. We all like actually that. are all birth signs, you guys being Virgo and me being Taurus. So take that as you will, I guess. But yeah, that, that's all we have on tarot today, a divination practice, which is to some people a scam at worst and a therapeutic practice at best. I hope you didn't find this episode tarot. <laughs> uh -huh. Gary, turn off your mic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> If, if this episode made you interested in a professional tarot reading, it's going to cost you around $30 to $50 on average. So hopefully... You leave there getting your money. Yeah, I'm going to charge $50. So, Jeremy, if you could just like Venmo me that or if you yeah. have it on you right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an IOU on that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, you guys know what to do. Leave a rating on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, wherever else to leave your review. 
So there was that, maybe a handful of stars as well, including re- leaving a Facebook recommendation. It really helps the show. Uh, please follow us on social media. We'd love to hear from you guys. We're on Facebook and Twitter, as well as Instagram and YouTube. I have been a lot more active in all of those right now, so definitely uh, get on that if you can. We're also on Patreon, so you can get some cool bonus content like blooper reel episodes and topic voting for as little as $1 a month. And if you have a topic, question, comment, criticism, or if you have a story you'd like to share with us on our counter series, maybe you had some sort of tarot experience you'd like to share, uh, please contact us on social media or email us at snipepumpodcast or gmail.com. Jeremy, thank you for joining us for this episode, and thank you for suggesting the uh, topic. Sir. It was really nice to have you on again. Yeah, it was great to be back, guys. Um, I mean, if you ever need a third guy, just let me know, and I'll be here in a heartbeat. You're welcome every time, Oh, yeah, man. for sure. And the best part is I don't got kids yelling in the background. I know. Yeah, I, only say, I, I about that. just... I about just handed you the reins, man. Said, "Screw this!" I was, <laughs> I was almost, and of course, it's all quieted down. Yeah, now. it's all fine now. No, I, but I don't have a scripted way to end this, so uh, goodbye, I guess. <laughs> Darren, you got to work right. on that, man. Tarot. This practice may not be as mystical as pop culture would lead one to believe. But beneath all the nonsense associated with it, it might actually be a helpful psychological tool. From major arcana to minor arcana, whether you believe in it or not, we hope the cards are always in your favor after hearing about this not-so-frightening folklore. Once again, we want to thank you for listening to Snipe Hunt. Your listening has been noted and will be reported to the proper authorities. All audio used was done so under the protection of fair use. Logo design is by Ethan Rothfuss. The music you heard in this episode was composed by Mayu and Nature World 1986. We'll continue to search for the unexplained and we'll hopefully see you on the next hunt.